Let's go. Let's dive in. Um, I always enjoy trying to introduce the subject. In the Peanuts comic strip, uh, Lucy, I, my big sister was Lucy to me. I mean, she just pummeled me for about the first six years of my life. Uh, I think that's why I like this story. But Lucy is the crabby, bossy, opinionated older sister of Linus and Rerun. Remember Rerun? He's, uh, these are just, if, if you grew up with Peanuts, these are just wonderful stories. Who bullies them constantly. Linus, of course, is the one with the security blanket, is passive and just lets, Lucy's always dominating him. But the younger Rerun sometimes stands up to his big sister. In the TV special, I Want a Dog for Christmas, Lucy walks up to Rerun, who's building a tower of blocks, and asks, what would he do if she knocked them all over? He responded, probably nothing at the moment. But years from now, after you're married and you and your husband want me to co-sign a note so you can buy a house, I'll refuse. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just think that's great. Uh, Sibling rivalry, that's what Cain and Abel is all about. And it's just amazing that it, the first event really in what we could call real human history. In the Garden of Eden, it's like, that's a little hard to understand that environment. And Adam and Eve were both created by God. It's like, okay, that took place in time and space, but that's sort of in a special category. But when you get out of Eden and Cain, Adam and Eve have two sons, okay, now you are in human history and event number one is brothers who can't get along. And I mean, they really can't get along. And I just said, telling jokes eases us into a subject that is not funny at all. And um, I would, I, and I even thought about it tonight, and just say, could we share some sibling stories in the room? <laughs> but that's probably too personal. But I suspect, even in this room, that there was stuff in our families. And the interesting part is, it keeps going when you get old. You can move away and get, man and like Rerun <laughs> said to Lucy, well, I won't do anything now, but... I haven't forgotten what you did to me, and uh, I won't sign your bank note or something. It, uh, most of us have our own sad stories of sibling conflict and hurt. The Bible tells us that the murderous cruelty in our world begins not out there between the nations, but in our own families. I just love the realism of Scripture. Oh my God, this just... Punches us in the gut like, I'd like to think that it's the Babylonians and the Assyrians that bring murder and cruelty into the world. That makes me feel a little safer. But God's word says that's not where it starts, Dan, and you and I both know that. One of the main themes of Genesis is sibling rivalry, or we could say brothers at war. Brothers at war. So it starts with Cain and Abel, and then in the next fall, we'll talk about Isaac and Ishmael. Um, then we get to Jacob and Esau, which are sort of the poster children with Cain and Abel for sibling. Oh my goodness, they hated, they were twins. And oh my goodness. Um, and then you get Joseph, and at least I guess in the Bible, the first instance of child trafficking. I mean, they trafficked him into, into slavery. They wanted to kill him. I mean, this is, this is not playful like Lucy and Linus and Rerun. That's, that's why I started there. That eases us into stuff that, I mean, it's dark, it's ugly, it's cruel, it's murderous. And it still goes on today, as we know. But Genesis is, that is the book of Genesis. The storyline of the book revolves around these family conflicts. Flicks. Genesis teaches that the wages of sin 
is relational chaos, conflict, dysfunction, and broken relationships. And what you've got in Genesis, in Genesis 3, the wages of sin is pretty much vertical. It's, oh my goodness, I'm guilty, and I'm ashamed, and, it's all, and I'm afraid of God, but I'm sort of looking, and God is kicking me out of the garden. So sin has vertical implications, but you turn the page, and suddenly it's me and my brother. In Genesis 3, God's question is, where are you? In Genesis 4, what's the question? Where is your brother? That, that's just, it, it's so good. Um, in 1991, some of you will remember, four white police officers in Los Angeles mercilessly beat an African-American named Rodney King after he was stopped for a traffic violation. The incident was captured on video and played over and over. In my mind, I can still see the video. Can you? I mean, it was, this was a big story, and it was awful. I mean, it was, it just hurt you to, to watch it. Um, then the policemen were put on trial, and they were acquitted of any criminal behavior, and riots erupted in Los Angeles. 53 people died, and over 2,000 were injured during the riots. Rodney King appeared on TV and famously asked, can't we all just get along? Do you remember that? So anyway, that, these things stick in my mind. And that's what I've chosen for the, the title, and it really added the word why. Why can't we get along? Why can't we get along? And I'm just saying that is a very good question. And it's exactly, I think, the question God wants us to ask by the time we get to Genesis chapter 4. The wages of sin is we can't get along. So let's talk about it. Cain and Abel. Um, let's, let's go ahead and read it. Let's just, let me introduce you to it. Let me read the, let's fill in the blanks first <laughs> on, the, on letter A, and then we'll read it. I'm, I'm trying to think of which is the best order. Uh, Genesis 4 is a story of firsts. So as I read the text in just a minute, listen for these firsts. And I'm sure I'm leaving something out. out. For one thing, you've got the first baby born in history. Adam and Eve were not born. They were created. I'm assuming... Adam didn't have a belly button. I mean, I think that's how we'll recognize him in heaven. I, I, don't, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Yeah, or Eve either. Yeah. Yeah. But with Cain and Abel and with the birth of um, Cain, who was the first human born, what joy Cain must have brought to Adam and Eve. They probably assumed this was the seed of the woman, the serpent crusher that God had promised. Remember last week we talked about, Eve, you're going to have a child, a seed, and he's going to crush the head of the serpent. Cain is born, and I wonder if they didn't say, this is the one God said was coming. What deception. What disappointment. This is anything but, this is more like the serpent than the serpent crusher. But the first baby is born. Number two, you have the first occupations. So we're no longer in the garden. Abel is a shepherd. Cain is a farmer. Wonder how many Western movies, you know, have that theme of the farmers hate the shepherd, the ranchers. They just, and they're warring. It's just sort of this theme in history. You have number three, the first death. And of course, it's a murder. But imagine what that first funeral must have been like. <laughs> you know, what, what is death? They've, nobody's experienced it yet. You've got number four, the first family. Many think the breakdown of the family is a recent phenomenon. Far from it. Genesis is full of dysfunctional families that frankly make some of what's happening today in our culture look tame in comparison. That's a that's a pretty strong statement. But you read the dysfunction in Genesis, oh my goodness. 
There's murder going on. There's incest going on. I mean, there's, it's big time serious. Number five, uh, you had the first worship service. And I'll just go ahead and tell you right up front, at the first worship service in human history occurred the first murder in human history. You just have to love the Bible. It's like, wow. I. And let me tell you, it's not the last murderous activity that goes on at church. Cain and Abel brought sacrifices to offer to God in an act of worship. Ironically, what appeared to be a very good human action turned into an occasion for competition, jealousy, hatred, and violence. Footnote. Yeah, let me... Um, corporate worship has often been a dangerous place where one receives the right fist of fellowship. <laughs> I think I got that from Chuck Colson. I forget who first I heard it from, but that's a great expression, the right fist to fellowship. Uh, and this is a verse I'll bet you did not know is in the Bible. It's from Zechariah. And if one asks him, what are these wounds on your back? He will say, the wounds I received in the house of my friend. John Wesley quoted that verse several times. He, I think, loved that verse because he had wounds on him that he got in church from his friends. <laughs> it's like, so I just say, welcome to church. Uh, and you may know this little poem, To dwell above with saints we love, that will be purest glory. To live below with saints we know, well, that's another story. <laughs> but Genesis 4 introduces us to the fact that church and worship, which ought to be the purest act humans can do, is often very violent, very ugly, very hateful, very competitive, with envy, jealousy, screw tape, screw tape. Screw tape. yes, oh my goodness. And I just love the fact that the Bible doesn't sweep that reality under the rug. It just says, let's talk about it on the second page of the Bible. And at least Genesis 4. This is, you come out of Eden, go to church, and it sort of goes south from there. It's like, okay, God. You've got also, number six, the first city. We're not going to... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you to it. The first murderer built the first city. We're going to look at this in a moment. That's very interesting. This gave rise to the birth of music and metallurgy. Come back next week. We'll talk about that. Cities in Genesis are ominous spiritual presence. Think of Enoch. That's the name of the first city. Babel is the next city. Sodom and Gomorrah are the next cities. I'm going to... I'm, I think I'll do a session on the meaning of the city. Jacques Ellul wrote a book years ago in the 60s called The Meaning of the City. And it's, it sort of was a game changer. But um, now Abraham, Hebrews says, is looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Augustine wrote a book called The City of God. Last page of the Bible, the new Jerusalem comes. So God is going to redeem the city, but oh my goodness, it's built by the first murderer. And then Babel, it's, it's confusion and judgment, and then Sodom. Okay. And then number seven, um, incidentally about cities, I just um, if you like Pilgrim's Progress, um, and I hope you do, but Vanity Fair. It's where John Bunyan talks about the meaning of the city. It is so good and it's so biblical in the way he's thinking about the city is worldliness. It's the things of this world. It's the love of this world. And it's the shaking of the fist at God. God said, scatter, fill the earth. And at Babel, they said, not going to do it. The more we get together, the happier we'll be. 
Um, that's not in the Bible, but... <laughs> I'm a strange person. You just got to put up with it. And number seven, you have the first cry for revival. In the midst of the social chaos and moral depravity, and if you remember what's happening in Genesis, all this is leading toward the moment when God says, I'm done. I'm going to send a flood. And we are going to start again. That's how bad it's about to get. That's what Noah's all about. But in the midst of that, the descendants of Seth began to call upon the name of the Lord. I wish we knew more. Okay, now let's read Genesis 4. We're going to read just the, the first half. Okay, we all set? <clears throat> Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived. Incidentally, look at verse 17. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived. Then look at verse 25. Adam knew his wife again, and she bore him a son. So you've got a major theme going through here that uh, the author obviously wants us to follow. Back at verse 1, she conceived this and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, the Lord had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. What emotion do you think is behind the falling of the face. We know he's struggling with anger. It says that. What's falling of the face? Jealousy? Maybe. Maybe depression? Uh, there's a lot of emotive words. Especially Cain is a very emotional kind of person. He gets, he feels things. And he feels anger and certainly jealousy. Uh, I think depression. And he's depressed that God is blessing his brother. That just infuriates me when God does that. <laughs> it's like, I, I get that. I actually get that. What were you going to say? Embarrassed. Embarrassed? Bring something and offer it to somebody. Okay. Yeah, what's wrong with my offering, God? Yeah. What's wrong with my offering? Good. Ego problem is a recipe. Um but a lot of emotive words. And uh, God is going to basically say to Cain, Cain, get in touch with your emotions. God is almost treating him like a psychologist. Listen to this. And the Lord said, verse 6, to Cain, Why are you angry and why are you depressed? Or why are you jealous? Why are... In other words... And I, I, I sort of picture God saying, and I'll wait for you to answer my question. Because I don't think Cain had thought about, well, why am I angry? But uh, Why is he angry? Why is he depressed? What's the answer to the question? Why is he angry? Yeah, you're being, you blessed my brother. I'm the firstborn. I'm the favored one. And it just, you know, it's like, it's, in school, I used to think, you know, why wasn't I born taller? You know, why wasn't I born the size of a middle linebacker? You know, why can't, I can't compete. I don't have equipment, and I, it's not my fault. God did this to me. Anyway, so why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? I, if you do right, I'll accept your offering. 
And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. In other words, this is a warning. Cain, there's something in your heart that's not, this story is not going to end good. Think about what you're doing. Verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And Cain said, I don't know. <laughs> liar, you liar. Am I my brother's keeper? Yeah, uh, and the Lord said, what have you done? In other words, God is giving him a chance to confess. Just like he gave Adam and Eve a chance. Come out of the shadows. Can we talk about this? Um, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. That's a beautiful verse. Every victim in human history. Their blood is crying out to God, and God hears it. Nobody else may hear it, but God hears the cry of those who've been unjustly treated. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Verse 12, when you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Adam was an alien. Cain was a fugitive. There's a difference. Adam just lost Eden, but Cain, you know, his picture is, hang, is hanging in all the post offices of, you know, there weren't many in that day, I can tell you that. Um, Verse 13, Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. And I almost feel g g pity for him there. You know, he, um, almost. Behold, you've driven me today away from the ground and from the face, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me, will kill me. There's apparently other people on the earth at this time. We'll talk about that in a moment. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Verse 17, we're going to stop at verse 16, but let me point out 17. Cain knew his wife. She conceived and bore Enoch. This is not the Enoch who walked with God. That's another one in the next chapter. So be patient. When he built a city, when Cain built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. So there's where Cain builds a city. And then uh, there's other stuff there about Lamech, the polygamist. And then the last verse of the chapter, uh, To Seth also a son was born. He called his name Enosh. And at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. Okay. Pretty interesting passage of Scripture. A few notes on the text. Um, let me do this quickly. Adam knew Eve, his wife. The Hebrew word to know is the word yada. Um, in the movie Seinfeld, doesn't they talk about yada, yada, yada? Isn't that where it is? I, uh, but it's a Hebrew word, it's good Hebrew, that means to know. And it indicates more than an animal, biological, hormonal sex drive to perpetuate the species. 
I mean, I guess evolutionists, I don't, I don't know that how they talk about these things, but I think they say, well, human sexuality is to perpetuate the species. It's like, that is not. That's what animals may do, or however we talk about that. But what humans do, it, this is not just an animal drive. It's knowing one another. Sexual expression in marriage is meant to be an intimate relationship where one, is fully, where one fully knows and one is fully known. I am... Uh, okay. Just another note on the text. Um, I'm, my punishment is greater than I can... What did he say? If you listen to Dennis Kenlaw preach much, you know that he loved this word bear. Bear. You, he talked about this word a lot. In Isaiah 53, where uh, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all, the Messiah, the bearing the world. Um, the cry is excruciating. And we almost feel pity for Cain. But there's not the slightest hint of remorse, regret, or repentance. I cannot find in Genesis 4. I, Cain is sorry he got caught. He's sorry for the consequences. He's sorry that he's a jerk and a no good bum. But he's not sorry that he killed his brother. He, there's no remorse in him. I can't find it. Note especially that Cain is bearing his own sin. And let me tell you, that will break you in pieces, to, to bear your own sin. Though God was offering to bear it for him, Cain opted to carry it for himself. This is the source of his deepest misery, and if he doesn't repent, he will bear it eternally, which I think is what hell is. Hell is a place where you can... Carry your own sin. It's like, that's hell. My punishment is greater than I can bear. God places a mark on Cain to protect him from vengeance. Rather than putting the murderer to death, God shows him mercy. No one really knows either what this mark was or where it was on his body, so don't ask me. I don't know. <laughs> It's one of those questions that you're saying, what was the mark? And uh, there's a lot of speculation you can read about it, but I didn't even find enough help to talk about it. It's, um, I just, I don't know. Um, number four, I'll just ask it for you. Where did Cain get his wife? This question always comes up. Um, our brother Mark last week, who was sitting over here, he told me after class, he said, you know the answer to the question, where did Cain get his wife? The answer is, well, I'd tell you if I was able. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good, actually. Where did Cain get his wife? The simplest answer is probably the best. Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. And Adam lived to be 930 years old. You can have a lot of children in 930 years. Now, I don't know how long Eve was able to be fertile, but I, I think I want to say the word obviously, at least in these first generations, there was a lot of intermarrying. Uh, there were no options. Now when Moses comes along, he says incest and marrying your sister is not permitted, but we're not to Moses yet. That's still a few millennia away. But to me, that answers a question in a way that satisfies me. Because Adam lived to be 930, he would have had many children and grandchildren. Thus Cain would have likely married a sister or a cousin. Though the Mosaic Law will prohibit such practice later, in the beginning it was apparently the only way to get the human race started. And some commentators have said, and if before the flood, you know, there were no diseases and there were, not like we know it today, in this canopy of 
water was over the earth, it might not have had the negative genetic impact that it could have. That, that's an interesting thought. Um, go visit the ark. You'll find tons of these questions. They talk about this stuff. They actually they study this stuff. Um, okay, letter C. Now we're getting to really the meat of what I hope we can do tonight. The big question is... Why did God accept Abel's offering but reject Cain's? Some have suggested that God was influenced by the offering itself. In other words, the thing that made God happy or unhappy was what was on the altar. What did you offer me? And for Cain, it was fruit. And for Abel, it was an animal that had been killed. It was a blood sacrifice. Okay, hold on, hold on. You're, you're, yeah. I love this group. Hold on, Pastor. We're getting there. Um, for some reason, God did not like Cain's offering. If this, uh, what, he, what he offered. In other words, God didn't like fruit. Uh, the fruit of the ground. Some have said things, well, the ground was cursed. So therefore... What came from the ground was cursed. It's like, uh, it's not convincing to me. But did, not, but did like Abel's offering an animal. But God has no problem with grain offerings. When you get to the book of Leviticus, there's chapter, at least one chapter, devoted to grain offerings. It's a very good offering for certain types of uh, situations. And there's nothing in the text that indicates animals and blood sacrifice are preferable. There's nothing in the text that says it. The probable reason is found not in the offering, but in the state of the worshiper's heart. Now, and I, I like this, this I, I believe this. You know, when you bring your offering to God, he's not really looking at the offering. You know, the woman who put two pennies in the treasury. Jesus he didn't look at the two pennies. He said, that woman gave a better offering than all you other PhDs in theology who put in $1,000 checks. And, of course, everybody looked at him like he was crazy. They said, but hers is two pennies. God does not look at our worship just on the externals. A, a second thing to say is Abel gave, and this is what, Richard was saying, the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. All it says about Cain's offering is he brought some fruit from the ground. Sort of nondescript. But for Cain, he didn't just bring an offspring. He brought the firstborn and the fat portions. He gave the best he had. His was wholehearted worship. Like David, Abel, I think, would have said, I will not sacrifice to the Lord that which cost me nothing. Isn't that a beautiful statement? Number three, Cain's offering, by contrast, seems, I'm reading between the lines a little bit, but to be mediocre, perfunctory, ritualistic, dutiful, and half-hearted. His heart wasn't in it. And if you say, how do you know that? I say, well, I don't know it when he's offering it, but after he offers it and God talks to him, that guy has all kinds of poison in his heart. <laughs> he hates his brother. He's, uh, he's jealous. He's bitter. The remainder of the passage confirms the poisonous attitudes hidden in Cain's heart. If you'd have been to sitting down the pew from Cain and Abel on that, Sunday, when they brought their offering, I think it would have looked the same from the outside. You would have said, I don't see any difference. But God was not looking at the offering. He was looking at the heart. Commenting on why God was pleased with one offering rather than the other, Victor Hamilton says, quote, Perhaps the silence is the message itself. In other words, the text doesn't specifically say. Now, let me explain why God was pleased with one offering and 
not the other. And incidentally, that's sort of how life works. God does not explain to us why he pours out blessings on some people and not on others. And that's part of what the message of this story, why was I born five feet nine rather than six feet six, you know, if you want to play basketball? Well, you got to deal with that. Or why was I born with an IQ of 64 rather than 140, you know? And why, why are some people better looking? You know, why are some people slender? Why are, why do some people's kids turn out wonderful? You know, you just got to deal with that. And if it turns you bitter and jealous, jealous and angry, that's not good. So perhaps the silence is the message itself. As outside viewers, we are unable to detect any difference between the two brothers and their offerings. Perhaps the fault is an internal one, an attitude that is known only to God. I like that. Okay. Um, are we doing okay? Analysis of a murder. So let's, let's talk about why did he do it. Not how did he do it, but why did he do it. And let's start with this question. Every detail of this story underscores the heinous nature of Cain's murderous act. And let me just mention six things. For one thing, it was his brother. This is not homicide, this is fratricide. It's a bad thing to kill a foreigner or an enemy, but to kill your own flesh and blood. Number two, it was his good brother, there's no evidence that Abel had done anything to provoke Cain, you know, like na 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 or some sort of what brothers can do. There's, I, every impression is Cain's a really good boy just doing his work, worshiping God, bringing an offering, pleasing mom and dad, and that drove Cain off the charts. That drove Cain off, and it had nothing to do with their relationship, it had everything to do with poison in Cain's heart. I, th this is so real. Um, Abel was a righteous man. And he's included in uh, Hebrews 11, the Faith Hall of Fame. A a a a right Abel was. Okay, number three. Showing the heinous nature of the crime. It was premeditated. This was no crime of passion or involuntary manslaughter. Cain was not suffering from temporary insanity. Think of all the defenses we use in courts to say, well, he may have killed him, but there were extenuating circumstances. He was having an affair with his wife, so he killed him. It was a crime of passion. None of that's going on here. He, uh, it was cold-blooded, calculated, Pre-planned act of treachery. Number four, he ignored divine warnings. God knew what was going on in Cable's heart and made a personal visit. <laughs> like a good psychologist, God warned, wants Cain to be in touch with his feelings. Why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? Sin is crouching at the door. Satan talked Eve into sin but not even God could talk Cain out. Not even God could warn Cain in a way that made Cain not do what he was hell-bent on doing. Number five. Afterward, when confronted about what he had done, he denied it. When God asked, where is your brother, he was not seeking information. <laughs> God knew where he was. He was inviting Cain to confess and repent. But Cain hardened his heart and refused. I'll keep going. I'm skimming the footnote there. Number six, and he did it during a worship service. And it just reminds me of Thomas, Archbishop Thomas Beckett. I think it's the 10th century or something was killed in Canterbury Cathedral. Murder in the cathedral. 
T.S. Eliot wrote about murder in the cathedral. It's one thing to murder somebody outside church, but it takes a certain sort of brazenness. So everything about Cain's deed is underscored as this is vile. This is blasphemous. This is high-handed sin. So, why did Cain kill his brother? Why can't we just get along? To quote Rodney King, why did he do it? Well, at least these, this is how I'm answering it. One, he killed his brother because he was angry and depressed about how God had blessed his brother. Life just wasn't fair. Why does my kid brother get more blessings than I do? Your blessings really bug me. When God is good to you, that makes me so angry. That just, that's so real. Jesus, I'm sorry? Jealousy. Yeah, I'm going to, that's number two. Um, Jesus told a parable about laborers in the vineyard. Remember, and he agreed with all of them, okay, you'll work for, was it one denarii? I forget what it was, but some started eight in the morning. Some started at 10 in the morning. Some started at noon. Some started at four in the afternoon and worked one hour. And starting with the ones that were hired at four, the master gave them all the same wage, what they had agreed to. But the ones that started at eight, were they were livid. They were livid. And this is it's a really a good parable. It's a troubling parable because they're like, I get that. I think I would be upset too. But l listen to how the master responds. The master said to them, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Whose money is this anyway? Do you begrudge my generosity? Cain's problem was not his, with his brother, but with God. I think maybe that's the primary point of Genesis 4. That the reason I hate my brother is not really my brother's fault. And it's not even my problem with my brother, it's my problem with God. Why did you bless them like that? Why did Hitler invade Poland? You know, I, I, that's, why, why do we not get along? The real problem is theological, not sociological. I, I would love to know what you're thinking right now. Number two, he killed his brother because he was envious. Tonight sometime, look up the words envy and jealousy. They're not quite synonyms. We use them as synonyms, but they're not quite. I think the name of Cain's sin is envy, which is one of the seven deadly sins, by the way. Cain was in competition with his brother. And why? And if you've got siblings, I mean, boy, competitive natures between siblings, oh my goodness, it goes so deep. But where does that come from and, and why? Aquinas, I love this, defined envy as sorrow at another's good. When life turns out good for you, it makes me depressed and angry. <laughs> it's like, and it's sort of true. I mean, I, I can get that. I have, this is how my mind works. A powerful depiction of envy is the scene in the movie Amadeus. Now, this dates me, but that, it's, that's a good movie about Mozart. And if you remember Antonio Salieri, the Italian who, who hated Mozart because God had blessed and the word Amadeus, Wolfgang, Amadeus, Mozart, Amadeus, what does it mean? Ama is from amor, and Deus is God. It means loved of God. That's who Mozart was. He was just blessed by God with this incredible talent. Salieri had had to go to school, and he, were, he was a very good composer, but he had to work. And then here's this sort of 
jerk of a kid who could just sit down and and it and it literally his jealousy literally drove him to the insane asylum if you remember the movie but the main part of the movie is there it's it's a study of envy it's a study of and it's it's i think worth seeing antonio salieri a brilliant hard working composer himself is consumed with envy of the amazing gifted of the young mozart his envy literally drives him insane you've got to read my footnote a humorous illustration of envy is seen in the remark by that famous theologian Irma Bombeck who said Lord if you can't make me thin then make my friends fat <laughs> and I really think it helps to laugh at these things because they're they're so vile when they have it, 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 it's not funny when hatred and jealousy consume a life like this. Why did he kill his brother? Number three, because his worship was defective. I think it went like this. You know, he went to church and sat on the pew, and during the opening hymn, you know, How Great Thou Art, or whatever they were singing. You know, he's looking down the pew, at, you know, and he's thinking about the, the new Lexus that he just parked his 10-year-old car next to in the parking lot and the, how beautiful the kids are down the pew. And the wife is so pretty, and my wife's not that pretty. And it's like that's, that goes on every Sunday in church. That goes on. It's, his focus was wrong. Rather than focusing on God and praying, the Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. He focused on his brother sitting down the pew and said, but I don't have what he has. The Apostle John, I just love how succinct this is. 1 John 3, 12. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? There's the question, and here's the answer. Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. When you do good things... It makes me want to kill you. It's like, welcome to human history 101. That is it. Okay. Let me turn with you to James 4. I've given it to you right here. It's in your notes. And um, just let me read it to you. And uh, this is how we're going to close. Listen to what James says. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Now, I don't know if he was thinking of Cain and Abel when he wrote that, but he could have been. So here's the question. Why can't we just get along? Why do we fight? And whether we're talking about nuclear war or a husband and wife pulling on the covers in bed at night, you know, who's going to get the cover? I mean, or whether it's Linus and Lucy. Whatever level, what, why do we do that? Okay, that's the question. What, and he's going to tell us both the cause and then the cure of conflict. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? In other words, there's war outside of you because there's war going on inside of you. Ooh, good point. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And I think it's appropriate to say you do not pray. You do not ask God. Some translations actually say you, ha you desire and do not have because you don't ask God. But you're not praying. So the reason you don't have what your passions want is because you don't know how to pray. And then you do ask or pray, but don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, don't you know 
that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealously over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace? Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now listen to the commands. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the one who's crouching at the door, whose desire is for you. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Draw near to God. God will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. That's a pretty amazing passage. Now, I want to analyze it with you. On letter A, I want to talk about the cause of conflict. And if you skip down to letter B, we're going to talk about the cure. See the two blanks there? So the cause and the cure, because I think that's what James is doing. And Cain and Abel are the perfect illustration. So what's the cause of conflict and broken relationships? Like a skilled doctor, looking beyond the symptoms of a disease to find its root cause, James digs deep, searching for the definitive explanation for why we can't get along with one another. He wants to explain, yeah, why we can't get along. Guided by the Holy Spirit, James discovers there are four levels involved in understanding the cause of our conflict. Peeling away the layers of the proverbial onion, James reveals. Okay, so the layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four. First level is unmet desires. What causes quarrels and fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war, you desire and do not have? So when I want something and don't have it, it makes me want to punch you in the nose. <laughs> and reciprocal. We want something that we believe will bring us happiness, and when that desire is unmet, then we pick a fight with whoever we perceive to be standing in the way, whether talking about a husband fighting for more covers on his side of the bed or Hitler invading Poland. The battle is caused by not getting what we want. You desire and do not have, so you murder, you fight and quarrel. The battle on the outside is caused by the battle on the inside. Now that's just the shallow layer. The reason I don't like you is because you are hindering me from getting my way at some level. Number two, second level calls prayerlessness. The reason, James says, our desires remain unmet goes deeper. We don't have what we want because we haven't prayed. Oh my goodness, it's like, how did that get in the discussion? Well, this is why we need God. He brings it in. Jesus urged us to ask for our needs to be met because our Heavenly Father is eager to meet our needs. I don't know if you know this quote from Spurgeon, asking is the rule of the kingdom. Ask, ask, ask. But this leads logically to a third level of reflection. But what if I do pray... What if Hitler had prayed, Lord, give me Poland? You get it. What would God have said? No, I'm not going to give you your prayer. Why? Because you ask amiss. You ask wrongly. You're not praying the right kind of prayers. And a lot of us don't. What if I do pray and ask God to give me what I want, but he doesn't answer them? Now here's the third layer of the onion. Third level, selfish ambition. The reason God doesn't answer our prayer is because we pray wrongly. We ask amiss. When our motives are impure and our will is not aligned with God's will, 
then our prayers don't get past the ceiling. Don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? God is not going to answer the prayers of His enemies. Those whose prayers are motivated by worldliness and selfish ambition. This leaves us with one final question. Then why, oh why, is my heart so worldly and at cross purposes with God? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with my heart that it wants things that it shouldn't want? And when we finally get to ask that question, I think God says, I've been waiting all your life for you to ask that question. Number four, the fourth level. I think this is the, the, the root. Fourth level causes double-mindedness and pride. The real problem, the root issue, is not what we do, even if it's murder. Murder is not Cain's root issue. That's a serious issue, but that's not his root issue. Or even what we want. The problem is who we are. And next week, I think we're going to talk about this verse, where Genesis 6, 5, God sees, and listen to the verse, every intention of the thoughts of our hearts are only evil continually. We are proud, and our will is at cross purposes with God. We are sinful, and our heart is polluted and divided. To be proud is to be God's enemy. This means that He will not answer my prayers, and thus my needs will remain unmet, and this makes me want to break your nose. <laughs> that is a genius statement of analyzing the problem, of why we fight in the world. And it really has nothing to do with you, why I want to fight you. It has everything to do with the egotistical, selfish pride in my own heart. And the reason I have that is because of the nature of man. So what's the cure? What's the cure? Letter B. We're right on time. This is going to work. In verses 6 to 10 of what I just read, explains the remedy. And listen to the commands. Submit to God, resist the devil, draw near to God, cleanse your hands, purify your hearts, humble yourselves. In other words, the cure for quarreling and fighting is entire sanctification. <laughs> that just makes me smile. And it's like I would have never thought of it in those terms. That was Cain's problem. He wasn't wholly devoted to God. It wasn't a problem with his brother. It was a problem with God. And that's why we're fighting in the world. That's why there's things like racism and violence and, a, and abuse. It's, 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 it's a theological problem. It works like this. Now I'm reversing the onion. When God sanctifies our hearts, then our motives are pure. And when our motives are pure, then our prayers are aligned with God's will. Then when our prayers are aligned with God's will, they are answered. <laughs> God says, I'd love to answer that prayer. Then when our prayers are answered, our desires are met. And then when our desires are met, we no longer want to quarrel and fight. And when this happens, for everyone, we'll be in the kingdom of God. That is just so good, even if I said that myself. <laughs> Let me pray, okay? Lord, thank you for your word. I just am always awed at how relevant it is, how it speaks, not just in history and theology, but it speaks right to where we are, to who we're sitting on the pew with in worship, for what's in our hearts. Lord, thank you that you've analyzed the problem, but you've also provided the solution. 
And we pray that you would work in our own hearts in such a way that our hearts are pure. And we can say, the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. And I'll even rejoice when you bless the socks off my brothers and sisters. That, nothing makes me happier than that. Oh Lord, would it be true that that could genuinely be the attitudes of our hearts. May the kingdoms of this world one day become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ when we all live with pure hearts and find our greatest joy when you bless our brothers and sisters. Speak to us, work in our hearts, heal our relationships, save our world. In Jesus' name, amen.